Writer, broadcaster, I'm a celeb campmate and ex-member of parliament for South Derbyshire, Edwina Curry is sat on my sofa today. I'm so pleased to have you here. How are you? Hi Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Lovely. In a stormy Derbyshire. Well, uh, it isn't actually storming yet, but the light outside is sort of, you know, that kind of mad electric blue. Mm. It's very humid. It's going to be a big storm. We might get interrupted at some point by a bang and a crash. And if it's, if it's uh, thunder and lightning, keep your head down. I'm guessing it's a much better sound than the person that's decided to mow their garden three doors down from here. Um, let's start with a big question. How do you feel about Boris Johnson and how he's getting on as Prime Minister? Um, that's one of the, the real bar questions, isn't it? The sort of thing that people ask you and talk to you about, approach you about, uh, wherever you are. Um, he's a real um, mixture. He's a real enigma, is, is Boris. I, I remember door knocking in, in December of uh, 2019 when we were doing the general election in a really rough part of uh, the constituency here in, in the High Peak, uh, which is a, a red wall seat. The, the whole street is covered in Labour posters. And I noticed this one house was slightly fewer than the rest. And I knock on the door. And the woman comes to the door and she says, oh, she says, you're Mrs. Curry, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. She said, uh, right, is this for election? I'm, yes, it is. <laughs> you know. And she says, I like Boris. I said, do you like Boris? Oh, I do. I like Boris. I said, really? OK, good. I said, well, what about the people next? You know, you've got posters up everywhere. And she said, oh, they come and tell you you've got to put them up or there's trouble so they just put them up and she gives a little shrug. I said, oh, really? So what about the people next door? I knew the people next door. He had been a councillor, a Labour councillor, and hmm. it's plastered in posters. And she said, him, him, she says. He's got a flagpole in back garden and it's got a flag of Cuba on it. I had to look it up. It's Cuba. <laughs> and he says, Cuba's wonderful. And I says, well, I don't know about that. I says, because my daughter's been to Cuba on holiday and she says there's a lot of poverty there. So <laughs> you, you, you put us down. Now there's four of us in this house and we're all going to vote with you. But don't tell anybody, it's a secret, all right? Oh God. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Boris appeals way, way beyond uh, the Westminster bubble, way beyond all the pundits, way beyond all the commentators. It was about the same time that I was doing um, a, uh, a news night, I did a news night clip uh, up in Wakefield uh, with uh, Kirsty Walk. And I said to her, you know, what it, you know when we were chatting beforehand, what, what have you been doing during the day? How, how do you find out what Wakefield or uh, an area like this is thinking? And she said it was astonishing. She said I was walking around the, uh, the market and um, people like Boris. And I yeah. said, and you are surprised. And she said, well, yes, of course. And I said, that's because you lot don't get out of London often enough. Now, what I personally think about Boris is the amused admiration, as it were, because he has an extraordinary ability to reach out to millions and millions of people whose voices are not normally heard, whose needs are not normally addressed, who are absolutely not served by the traditional Labour Party, that's for sure, who've been taken for granted for years and are sick and tired of it. And they do get the feeling that Boris is listening. Now, to be fair, that election was all about getting Brexit done. Yeah. Uh, and this government was elected to get Brexit done, uh, which they managed to do a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks after that, we are into a pandemic, a global pandemic, the likes of which none of us have ever seen. And yeah. some of us have only just barely written, read about and so on. I mean, my, my great grandfather died in the Spanish flu of uh, September 1918. So I know a little bit about it. I've got his death certificate. But um, they, to, to, to put any government, let alone an inexperienced one, into that situation was a real ask. And I think probably Boris didn't really get his head around it quickly enough. I think he's admitted that. But once they got onto it, uh, since about April, May last year, I think it's been conducted extremely well. And particularly thinking far ahead, not just reacting to events, but things like putting a lot of money, a lot of money into vaccine development. Um, so the, mm -hmm. the Oxford AstraZeneca one is a, is a world beater. 
things like uh, getting tests and trace set up from scratch, which was <laughs> it does actually exist. It didn't exist, you know, 18 months ago. There was no such thing. Um, plus the... Has that not been a big damp squib, though? Well, it was always bound to be um, not as successful as everybody thought because we are a service industry and we have a large number of people working in the service industry who can't afford to stop working. So yeah. there was yeah. always going to be a, you should stop work. And the answer is, listen, mate, You've got a civil service salary. It doesn't matter whether you are at work or not. You're going to get paid and you're going to get your pension paid. Mm. Um, I'm a delivery driver. If I don't actually do my job, I don't get paid. So Mm. there was always going to be an element, again, of, shall we say, middle class misreading of how people were likely to respond. But I think the fact is that nevertheless, it's still looked after if not 100 percent of the population a very substantial part it's played its part it just wasn't quite as good as boris uh, was boasting that's his main fault he will paint a rosy uh you know really cheerful glass half full picture when actually the glass is steadily emptying i think that's his biggest strength if he has one in my eyes talking about everything in a rosy way like the glass half full i think people that's what people want to hear whether it's true or not and he knows that depends which people you're talking about you know we're, we're a nation of 65 67 million people i don't think anybody knows quite now just how right now how many people we've got in britain um but we are a very very diverse bunch of people across the age groups across the geography of the country across the different ethnic groups and cultural groups and um you know it's very easy indeed to get things wrong if you are just based in london that's always been the case, but the rest mm. of the country, I think, has been a bit acquiescent until until now. And now the rest of the country is saying, you know, sod you, you either do what we want or we're not interested. And Boris is very, very good at picking up those sort of nuances. Um, yeah. When, yeah. It, when it comes to things like lockdown, um, it, it's interesting how it's panning out now when we, when we have the choice. And I think it's a very sophisticated and mature thing to do, to say to people you have the choice, whether you wear a mask or not. Um, what I notice is about half do and about half don't, but the, the composition of the travelling public uh, has changed. Whereas it used to be the case that I'd be surrounded by people older than myself, these days I'm surrounded by people who are younger than myself. And I think it's the more confident younger groups that are taking advantage of this and the older groups who are still extremely cautious. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, what do you think about youngsters getting offered freebies to get the vaccine? Well, as long as it's not pizza. I mean, that <laughs> an absolute nonsense. Of, it, I think there's a cartoon in the Telegraph today saying, pig out to help out. Ah. I worry about the people that have on their own volition gone and have the vaccine, though. What do they get? Smugness. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. And good health. Twitter, somebody was talking about the effects of the vaccine, of being vaccinated. And I posted on Twitter, oh, I was very pleased with my experience. It made me kinder, more thoughtful, more intelligent. Oh, yes, what's not to like? What a brilliant tweet. So we've talked about Boris Johnson and the Conservatives. What are your thoughts on Keir Starmer and the current Labour Party? Oh, long may they reign, hey? Long may they reign in opposition, by any chance. In perpetuity in opposition, yes. Um... Keir, Keir has a big problem. He was chosen to detoxify the Labour Party after yep. the yep. terrible time they had with Jeremy Corbyn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that gives him several problems. The first is he hasn't really got the backing of a lot of the people in the Labour Party to do that. The second problem is, actually, most of his activists were Corbynistas. Right? And um, if he detoxifies by getting rid of them, um, they're going off to the Green Party. Mm. which is uh, weakening Labour's position in, in a bit of a scattergun uh, way. I'll give you an example. Um, in the May elections here, the county council elections in Derbyshire, yeah. um, I stood against the Labour incumbent who had been the Member of Parliament and um, the Liberal vote disappeared, the Green vote was non-existent and she won it. But yeah. next door in Chapel in the Thrift, um, where actually I think everyone's much more worried that we might not actually win it. It was a, it ha- had been a Conservative held seat by an old chap for very, very you know, decades, and he had uh, retired, so we had a new guy. And um, the opposition to the Conservatives split, and I think they had 900 
Green votes and 1,100 Labour votes and our chap romped home with a big majority. So that's what's happening in some areas. Now, Kira, mm, yeah. uh, from what I can see, Kira's a nice guy. Um, unusual in politics, because you actually have to be ruthless to, to uh, get things done and to take decisions that people don't like. Um, he's not a politician. I don't think he has a politician's instinct. He's trying to satisfy too many people. Uh, he's not been in Parliament long enough, in a way. And yeah. I mean, his only successes are being scored at Prime Minister's Question Time, which in the sum total of things in 2021 doesn't matter very much. It, it might have done in 1921, but it doesn't matter now. Mm. Um, so he's, uh, and he's not very inspiring. And he's another white, middle-aged, well-educated London bloke. Oh, please, you know. The Labour Party's got to overcome its own prejudices before it starts lecturing the rest of us. Well, you say that, but that description that you just gave could apply to Boris Johnson, other than the middle class bit. Ah, but Boris, you see, I mean, for, for us, a foreign name and a Turkish grandfather. Um, and uh, Boris is clearly quite bonkers in many ways, which is very appealing. It, 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 he, Boris is, is not a conventional personality. Mm. I mean, quite anything else, if, if, if you know a little bit about the history. Uh, he had a scholarship to Eton. You know, he, he didn't come from a conventional, wealthy banker's family. His father, Stanley, turns out to have been quite a raffish character. And the kids basically brought themselves up. They were feral kids in the middle of Dartmoor. Um, they, uh, the fact that they've all managed to grow up without killing each other, I think, has been a great success. I wouldn't believe that you were talking about a prime minister there. He's anti-convention. <laughs> Starmer has convention as his middle name. Hmm. And that, I think, everybody has detected very quickly. Uh, but uh, no, that said, in, in, in all sincerity, I wish Keir Starmer well in getting rid of the anti-Semitic elements in his party, yeah. trying to change its approach. Um, for uh, the, the, some of the Jewish members of Parliament, like Luciana Berger, yeah. the, the uh, last couple of years of Corbyn rule were horrible, hmm. horrible. And I, I have many Jewish friends and family and relatives and so on. Um, and they were heartbroken at what was happening to the Labour Party under Corbyn. Uh, they look for better things under Starmer. And I do hope that that happens for the sake of all of us. If you prejudice against one lot, if you allow racism against one lot, then you allow racism to perpetuate through society. And it's wrong and shouldn't have never ever happened. Absolutely true. But then I feel I have to bring up Mr Johnson again and pull up his comments about letterboxes and watermelon smiles, etc. Oh, yeah, but I've read that article, you see. And yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is the difference. He wrote, he was writing in the Telegraph at the time that Denmark banned the burqa. Yeah. And what he was writing in that article was that we shouldn't ban the burqa, we shouldn't ban any clothes, we should let people wear whatever they want, whatever message or statement they want to put out. Um, the quotation about looking like post box and so on actually wasn't from him, it dated to more than a decade earlier, hmm. uh, and it came from um, uh, um, 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 an ethnic minority campaigner who herself didn't want women to be condemned to wearing the burqa. I mean, I think the burqa is horrible. I think anything that that um, objectifies women in that way um, is is um, a really unattractive way. I have the same view about six and seven inch stilettos, you know. Yeah. I hate them. And any attractive women on TV that I see wearing them, I say, why are you wearing that rubbish? Why don't you wear ordinary shoes that you can run in and be you know, fit and strong and healthy and they're rubbish. Yeah, I heard Denise Van Outen on Gogglebox talking about um, how high heels have wrecked her feet and left her with plantar fasciitis not long ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I haven't worn uh, high heels of any kind, I think probably just about ever, uh, but certainly not for the last 25 or 30 years. And one of the reasons is I think that kind of clothing, very tight, very sexual clothing, very high heels... It says, I'm a woman, I'm a sex object. Mm. And my reaction to that is, I'm a woman, I'm as smart as you are. Yeah, great line. More like focus on what's inside rather than what's outside, as you would with maybe a male. Well, what goes on between my ears is what 
I think, defines me. Mm. What goes on between my legs is my business and not yours. Well, you say that, but we'll get on to that later. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned Brexit earlier on and how Brexit got done uh, by Boris Johnson. Regardless of which way you voted in 2016, how do you view the direction of Brexit now? Well, I was a Remain campaigner. I was a Remain campaigner. Well, I stood for the European Parliament in mm. 1994. I was vice president of... Um, one of the European groups, it's so long ago, I can't remember which one. You know, me, and, me and Peter Mandelson and mm. Emma Nicholson all stood on the same platform at one stage, had all our photos taken together. Um, and uh, I was chairman of uh, a conservative group for Europe in Parliament. The reason being, Richard, that I was, I bought into, and in a sense I still do, the idea of countries that have been at war with each other cooperating with each other, trading with each other, learning more about each other's interests and passions and prejudices, and traveling yeah. freely between these countries. Um, I still find that lovely. I have um, family in France. I had a house in France, a cottage in the Loire for 14 years. Gorgeous. And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's my idea of a little paradise. Mm. But, 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 but when the vote came, we lost. Yeah. And more important in a way is faith in democracy and having a democratic system stronger, not weaker as a result. And I thought much much of the shenanigans in Parliament were appalling, appalling. John Burko, my God, what a, what a rogue. Oh, he's a hero for us lefties though now. Awful man, awful. Well, I've known him since we were all students. He's always been an awful man. But he really excelled himself in his term as a speaker in the, in the final couple of years in Parliament. Um, and also, the way that the EU behaved, it was very clever and it was very political and they were doing their utmost to ensure that we didn't leave. Mm. That's very naughty and it became, um, it, it became the thing that really pushed me into thinking, look, if that's what we're being asked to remain in, I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, I'm an economist by training, uh, you know, economies adjust, business people adjust. Uh, it's a bit of a faff when you're having to fill in a different pattern of paperwork or, or whatever, but everything's done online these days anyway, um, and it should be, with goodwill, it should be fairly easy to do. Uh, in fact, many of the dire predictions of Remain turned out to be completely, complete rubbish. You know, the economy hasn't tanked. Um, our, our, our country is, is still vibrant and prosperous. Um, the damage that's been done even by, by uh, COVID, uh, we seem to be recovering from very quickly. I think we have a new breed of business man and woman, new breed of entrepreneur. God, we haven't even got the right word for it, have we, in, in English? Um, and we, we seem to, see, to have far more people around that see opportunities instead of uh, uh, barriers. That's got to be a really, really good thing. And I can see a, a, a good, strong future for us. Uh, uh, certainly the way I would hope it would be. And hopefully, at some point in the future, the European leaders might replace the awful people that are running Brussels at the moment, um, whose decision-making on just about everything seems to be dire, uh, mm. with, with a more responsible, um, more thoughtful, more cooperative bunch of people. So could you see us rejoining then, if that was the case? Well, I can see us having the closest trading relationships in future. Yeah. But I can't see us sharing um, the power to make our own laws. I think we tried it and it failed. It wasn't a success. It was never popular. But trading together, oh, sure. I mean, uh, and, and making people welcome. Over the weekend, I went back to a place that I used to eat in a lot in London, which is called Le Beaujolais. Mm -hmm. It's in Titchfield Street. It's next to the Ivy. It's much better than the Ivy. Much better. <laughs> and it's run as... Um, a members club because um, uh, Joel, the, uh, the chap, chap who originally ran it, decided that, yes, he wanted to cook French food, uh, but he didn't care about the critics and he wanted to choose his customers. So to be, to be able to eat there, you have to pay quite a lot of money and he can decide whether he wants you in his club or not. Um, and I had contacted him and said, I'm coming to London, haven't been for a long, long time. Um, and his, his, uh, he's now retired, he's 83, but his replacement, Jean-Yves, said, oh, yes, I remember you, I remember you, yes, you're, you're very welcome. 
and it's a place where everything's French. The yeah. food yeah. is French. The wines, the entire wine list is French. Not just French, North France, Saumur and Normandy and, and oh my God. Um, and it's the sort of place I could die in, I really could, um, under the table somewhere. And staff, <laughs> nearly all the staff are French. And I want people like that to feel at home in Britain, but I don't want them to lose what makes them special. Mm. Yeah, at the time, um, the partner that I was with was a Spanish guy. Um, and as soon as the results came in, I remember he felt so unwelcome instantly. And I thought it was so sad. Yes, uh, that's right. That, that's how cultures change. Uh, and there's a sense in which I think the British have felt unwelcome in, in, in Europe for a while. And it was something that perhaps leaderships were not quite so, as sensitive to as they perhaps uh, should have been. The yeah. the uh, the vote happened on a if I remember rightly happened over a weekend Thursday can't remember exactly and um, yeah it was on the Thursday we got the results during Friday on Tuesday um, our lovely cleaner came and she's Polish and mm-hmm. um, my husband and I made a point of presenting her with a bouquet and saying we love you will you keep coming <laughs> and we all stood there crying. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? What a heartwarming moment. So you said about the vote, and obviously um, Leave won. That's not debatable, that happened. Um, do you think, though, as it was so close, that that should have been taken into consideration? No, absolutely not. Um, the the ref- referenda are a bad idea. Um, mm. it, it was Atlee, I think, who called them a device of demagogues and dictators. And we didn't have them post-war for a long time. Not least because Hitler had used them in order to shore up all his powers and his you know, plebiscite votes, 92%, something like that. Oh, yeah, and he murdered the other 8%. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, they're not a good idea because they, they suggest that decision-making is binary. Mm-hmm. Certainly in the five years since the Brexit vote, we know it's not binary. All sorts of shades of um, elements and discussion and questions that don't get answered by a vote yes or no, or remain or leave. What it demonstrated at that time, I think, that there was a kind of arrogance in Parliament. There was an assumption on the Remain side, led by David Cameron, of course they would win, against um, a background that, um, you know, whenever you invest money, they always warn you that, um, that the future is not guaranteed by the past. And everyone says, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they invest their money in stupid things sometimes. And referenda are exactly the same. So we'd had a referendum uh, called by Cameron on um, alternative voting. That had been one hands down. We'd had a referendum called in 2016, uh, sorry, in 2015 on, um, I'm going to get the dates out, it doesn't matter. We'd had a referendum called on the Scottish um, independence issue 2014, and, that was 2014 yeah. and that was hands down and I think Cameron probably thought oh this is easy <coughs> this is a way to get this wonderful compliant public to do to to endorse what we want and um, we want to stay in the EU and the wonderful compliant public um, decided the opposite now there are a number of aspects to it I mean, for example, we hear how how Scotland voted to stay in. Yeah, but you look at the turnout in parts of Scotland where it might make a difference, and you're talking about turnouts of 61, 62% in places like Glasgow. They didn't bother in many parts of Scotland. um, Can't be bothered, actually scored more than either remain or leave. So, you know, I I have no truck with that sort of idea. Um, In the end, everybody knew what the vote was for. Everyone knew. Um, most of the people that I know and have chatted to on an anecdotal basis who voted Leave said it was to do with politics, not economics. Yeah. And that yeah. therefore they knew that there, were, there might be a cost uh, and they were prepared to pay that cost in order to have that kind of freedom. And there's another element to it, Richard. I, must, I find myself thinking about it long and hard afterwards there's something magical about the idea of a nation that is determined not to belong to any other nation 
or to be forced to do something it doesn't want to do. Last time this country got invaded was 1066, well, successfully invaded, was 1066. They've repelled all borders since. Mm. And in 1944, just before I was born, they went back into Europe, which they did not have to do. And they put hundreds of thousands of young men and women at risk. And they went to give liberty to their neighbours. And there was an element of self-interest on the basis that if your neighbours aren't free, you can't really be free. But they didn't have to do that. And they did it because they believe in, in that kind of freedom of choice. I think that's wonderful. I don't think the UK would be nearly as wonderful a country as it is um, if we were acquiescent to a bunch of non-elected people in Brussels. So do you think if they rerun the Scottish independence referendum now, it would be a completely different result? Well, politicians learn not to answer hypothetical questions <laughs> because they're then held up when the real question comes up uh, in some time uh, in the future. There's not going to be a Scottish referendum in this parliament, apart from anything else. The government's got too much else to do. Uh, and the general election is going to be in 2024. So we're, always, we're already getting close to that. This, this, this is uh, not going to happen, but it might happen in the next parliament, by which time you're talking nah, at least 10 years. And can you see that headed by Boris Johnson? Oh, I think Boris could win it. Yeah. You think he'll still be there then, yeah? Yeah, Boris is a brilliant campaigner. Brilliant mm. campaigner. If he's, if he's healthy enough and if he wants to, I think he could certainly do that. Um, and then it'd be interesting. We'd have our, um, probably our, our, our first Pakistani heritage Muslim prime minister. Don't know which one, but yeah. several of them. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we um, a long um, way? Aren't the Tories a long way ahead of the Labour Party? Yeah. Well, if you were talking about visuals, then yeah, I'd have to agree. But if you're talking about uh, actual representation of the communities that those people come from, I think Labour would win hands down. It's one, I think one of the reasons, let, let, let's just hold that thought for a moment. Let's just finish with Scotland, because I haven't answered your question and I like to do that. Um, I think actually when push comes to shove and um, there is a vote that will change the whole status of Scotland, I think they might be more surprised at the result. I mean, last time it was a decisive no. A yeah. decisive yeah. no. I think the nationalists were quite surprised. And actually, last time, there was a, a slightly better economic argument for it than there is now, because for so, so many decades, the argument for the Scottish economy being able to survive and thrive was because of North Sea oil. Well, you know, we're heading into zero carbon. That's not going to be as easy in future. Plus, the North Sea uh, fields are more depleted than they used to be. <laughs> it was a good argument back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. But yeah. it's not a good argument now. So uh, my own feeling is that um, I think for the second time, the answer would be no. Um, and that would be the end of Nicola Sturgeon. Yes. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> somebody more respectable in. Um, You're not a fan then. <laughs> um, no, she's, she's a wee nippy sweetie. You know, she's a sour, a sour lady. She, she's a very, very good communicator, but I don't think she's a nice woman and I don't think she's a good woman. But there you go. Now, um, let's come back to, what was it we were talking about? Lots. Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> the Scottish referendum. Scottish referendum. It'll, it'll, it'll come back. One of the things that happens, you know, when you're nearly 75 like me, is you can only hang on to one thought at a time. Uh, it does make one more single-minded, but it does mean that one uh, one uh, can drift somewhat. That happens to us hanging on to our 30s as well. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the most well-known politicians of modern times. If you could give Mr Johnson one piece of advice, what would it be? Comb your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um... He sometimes looks as if he is so focused on what he's going to do and say. His yeah. mind is racing. He's a quite brilliant man. Uh, you know, the, the, he's, he's not dumb. He's not a fool. Mm. And I think for many years, the playing the fool bit has been a cover, an excuse to give him a chance to look around, assess the situation mm -hmm. and... Um, 
uh, and not to have to waste any time, but to be able to cut to the, the, the chase. But it's, when you're a leader of a country, you are representing it. And it, every, time he, every time I see him coming out with his hair a mess, I'm half looking at his flies to see if he's done them up. <laughs> Carelessness is not a, an attractive trait. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you bear in mind that, you know, we have, what, 10 million older people in this country. Uh, we remember when everybody, when all the men had to wear suits and shirts and ties. Yeah. And, uh, he does that. So comb your hair and polish your shoes. Do it. Well, I've never noticed his shoes, but I feel like now I'll be looking. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Right, can we go back in time? Can you explain to me how and why you got into politics, Pete? Um, I was born into Liverpool immediately after the war, and it was a long time, I think, until I realised that I was born into a city that had been traumatised by the war, it had been flattened, mm -hmm. flattened. It was a mm -hmm. group on bomb sites, wherever you looked. Three-legged dogs and so on, the kind of thing you see from... Oh, no, Kosovo or, or yeah. Uh, yeah. Lebanon. That's how we grew up. We were permanently dirty. The air was horrible. Um, uh, you, you saw a lot of people with disabilities caused by the war. My dad was a tailor. He used to specialise in making um, uh, overcoats and suits for sea captains and he was particularly good if somebody had lost an arm in the war that kind of thing because the merchant navy was so badly hit um, you know Liverpool's not a military port it was it was the uh, battle of the Atlantic port so many people were were, were damaged and I, I think the, the family and the community I grew up in also um, had PTSD because it was an orthodox Jewish community they mm. never talked about what had happened. The term Holocaust is fairly recent. They never talked, but you'd occasionally catch a, a glimpse of somebody's arm and it had a tattoo on it, and they would cover it up. They wouldn't talk about it. Mm. You would hear people whispering in corners when you were a child. And nothing good ever came out of Germany, I remember my mother saying. Mm. And what that tells you is you cannot ignore politics. No Nobody can ever say, I'm not involved and I don't care. The decisions of governments are all around you. The decisions of governments fighting oppression, fighting murder, fighting genocide are all there. Mm -hmm. And if you don't step up to the plate, who will? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, it may be somebody more wicked. It may be somebody more stupid. It may be somebody lazier. You have to step up to the plate. You have to, you have to help keep that, um, those options open and, and get good decisions taken. Uh, but there was a more practical reason, because I realised very quickly that if I wanted to get into Oxford and Cambridge from Liverpool, from a grammar school, I was going to have to do exactly the same as Margaret Thatcher did, um, which is go for the sciences. Uh -huh. To go for the sciences, you need to show that you're more than just a scientist. Um, and I had the misfortune that I didn't like Jane Austen. I still don't. I didn't like Dickens. I do now, but I didn't get him then. Um, I found Shakespeare on the page hard work. Still do, but love it on the stage. So I couldn't do English. So my alternative, my, my backup, um, was going to be current affairs. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Liverpool Municipal Debating Society and I learned how to make speeches. Um, I debated in school. Funny enough, in, in, when I was 14, Macmillan, Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister, came to Liverpool yeah. and made a speech in the Philharmonic Hall about how we should join the common market. <laughs> and it went down like a lead balloon in Liverpool because, of course, it faces the wrong way, it faces uh, the Americas. And we had a debate in school and one of the teachers said to me, Edwina, I want you to, to take part in this debate. I, OK, what do you want me to do? Um, and she said, well, we want you to present the argument for joining the common market. Yeah. And I said, well, how on earth do I do that? She said, you read the Daily Telegraph. They're all in favour. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I've, I've been reading the Daily Telegraph in all its vicissitudes and variations ever since. Um, and three people voted for it. 
when 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 we actually had the vote after the debate. Mm. That's partly because I was no good, but also because Liverpool <laughs> was dead against. So then I go to interview at, uh, at Oxford and Cambridge, and I've got a bit of background. I've got something I can talk about. I have yeah. opinions, and I've got a Scouse accent, you know. <laughs> and the Beatles are famous, and um, you know that sort of thing started to make a difference. Before I knew it, I'm being offered a scholarship. You know, what would induce you to come to St Anne's? Well, a scholarship. Right, you've got one. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so that's the, hindsight. That's hindsight. Yeah. At the yeah. time, what you do is you you do... It's like people at the Olympics. You do your best. Yeah. You aim, yeah. aim as high as you can. You aim to enjoy what you're doing and don't worry about it. You're not a failure if you don't get in. You know, you're not a failure if you don't get a bronze. Mm. Uh, and then you look round and think, oh... Where's everybody else? I'm on the podium. <laughs> yeah, what a good feeling. What a good feeling. Mm. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> oh, fabulous. I locked myself in the bathroom and cried. Well, I'd escaped. <laughs> I'd escaped. Um, I could see at that time, you're talking about 1964, Liverpool was going down the pan. I mm. mean, Derek Hatton was a contemporary and he was dead set on wrecking all the good stuff of Liverpool. Mm. I think he probably still is been arrested not long ago is that right how often do you travel back to liverpool then um i've got family well elderly cousins i mean people in their 80s now mm -hmm. um, still there and um we're keeping we keep in close touch they are very remarkable people um yeah I'm quite looking forward to being sort of spiky and feisty and having pink hair well into my 80s like some of my cousins great stuff <sighs> Uh, I've introduced my currently 15-year-old granddaughter to Liverpool and she loves it. She really? Loves it. Good. Yeah. Good. it is an absolutely brilliant city. It, yeah, but you see, it's not one city. This is what visitors don't realise. Mm. You've got all the tourist attractions, world-class tourist attractions like the um, Museum of Liverpool, Museum of Slavery, uh, mm. right on uh, the Maritime <coughs> Museum, right on the front. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you've got... Uh, wonderful shopping and, and uh, entertainment activities. About from uh, about the waterfront back, about maybe half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Yeah. And then you're into some horrible slums and poverty, mm -hmm. and there's not that much disconnect. Then you go another half mile, and you're into some really very nice suburbs, which is really where I grew up. Uh, yeah. The the, uh, the thing that's made the real difference in Liverpool, I think, has been the universities. You've got mm. two and a half, if you count Liverpool, Hope. You've got three universities there, which means you've got 100,000 students and all the, uh, arriving every September with their families and their so middle-class middle expectations intact. Mm. And um, that's making, I think, a big difference. Yeah, I'm from. I'm originally from Ellesmere Port, so very much Liverpool overspill. So it's very much part of our education how badly Liverpool was affected during the war. My my husband grew up in Port Sunlight. His home oh, no, was in Port Sunlight, and um, he says he can remember watching Liverpool burning. He would be about three oh, years old, and you could see Liverpool burning. I mean, don't underestimate the impact that has, and how horrendous. How it saps people's energy, initiative, um, and how hard it is from there onwards to be bright and bouncy and full of, you know, desire for excellence. It was a long, long time before much of that um, was, was conquered. And in mm. some parts of the city, you still have hundreds of thousands of people who believe that nothing will ever improve in their lives. Which is really sad. Um, politics at the minute is the most divisive that I can ever remember. However, I would imagine working under Margaret Thatcher, it was pretty similar. Did you ever used to get abuse shouted at you in the street? And do you still now? No, not really. I do get people occasionally wanting selfies um, <laughs> whose manners could be improved. Let's put it like that. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I feel for poor Chris Whitty because he's such a shy man in so many ways. Yeah. I'll give you an example, you know, walking through Manchester a little while ago and I get grabbed by a, a, a gaggle of screaming girls going, ah, 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 and they grab me and they take selfies. And I know they, 
because I'm a scouser. <laughs> you know, I grew up like that. I mean, I know they mean no harm. And um, uh, as they walk away, they don't say a word. They don't say thank you or anything. They don't say good morning, <laughs> Mrs. Curry, or anything like that. Uh, as they walk away, I hear one say to the other, well, I know she's, I know she's famous, but who is she? My God, how times have changed, eh? You always seem such a resilient person, though. Does that help? Um, she's always behaved better than those who attack you. You should always set an <coughs> example. Not least because there's always other people watching. Don't retaliate. Hmm. Don't retaliate. If, you're, if you see trouble, sometimes the best thing to do is not walk towards it, but walk away from it. Um, you know, dodge around the back of the building, that kind of thing. Uh, in Margaret's day, it was very clear that we had a, a, such a big job to do. We've been elected to do something about the crumbling economy. The main, uh, the main uh, cause was that, that was held up that could be changed by Parliament uh, were the immunities of the trade unions. Mm-hmm. That, so that a trade union couldn't be sued, um, trade unions could be intimidatory, trade unions could take action against employers, trade unions could destroy businesses, and all of that could be changed by changing employment law, which we did. And uh, Norman Tebbit, I think, should take the credit for that. Uh, in, and, and we did it a bit at a time, and each time what was done proved work it, workable and acceptable. So then you, you keep moving on until you get to the stage where there aren't any strikes. Because then that starts to answer the second big problem, which was a huge lack of investment. Uh, the British government couldn't afford to do it. Uh, businesses in Britain couldn't afford to do it. But inward investment started to flow in a big way. Um, and I was very much at the heart of um, when Toyota decided to come to Britain. They wanted Toyota wanted to come to Europe and were felt very insulted by the reaction of the French government who called them aliens mm-hmm. and they'd had a hard time when they developed in America they had a plant in Oklahoma and they had found that they were not being well treated there but they liked Margaret Thatcher and they liked mm-hmm. the idea of a country that didn't have strikes and mm-hmm. when I was interviewed uh, a lot when they were uh, by their advisors Along, uh, much of the questioning was about how will people react to a Japanese company? Will they come and work for us? And I said, uh, you treat them well and you pay them well and they not only will they work for you, but you'll get a good reputation. Um, they took me out to Japan to show me their working patterns. You know, a whole host of things like that. And then they just invested heavily. Uh, Nissan had done it years before. But once Toyota are doing it, we're into the situation where about 40% of all the inward investment coming into the whole of Europe is coming into Britain. And that started to make such a huge difference. So divisive, yes, but Mm. you can't satisfy all the people all the time and you shouldn't try. What you need to do is figure out what the right thing is to do and do it while respecting the other views and trying to compensate where there's a problem, uh, trying to identify uh, and consolidating, and of course, talking about your successes all the time so that you win the propaganda war. Do you remember the first time you met Mrs Thatcher? Um, Face to face, it was when I came into Parliament. Hmm. Um, Actually seeing her in action was 1975, when she had... uh, just become the leader of the Conservative Party. I had just become uh, a councillor on Birmingham City Council and was thrilled to bits with myself. Uh, We were in opposition at the time, but we had every hope of winning it, which we did the following year. Um, I had a new baby, um, I parted the baby with hubby, and I went to the party conference. And I heard her make that wonderful speech, stuff about how the state is our servant, not our master. Great chunks of it carved on my heart. Oh my <laughs> God! I came home. I must have been in absolute pain. That was, that was. She said the things I wanted to hear. A bit like Boris speaking to northern working class communities. Yeah. Now, yeah. Margaret was saying what I wanted to hear, 
about a positive future based on our own hard work, energy, initiative mm. and enterprise. And it was so refreshing and we realised she meant it. Yeah, I suppose that's one thing that can be said for Margaret Thatcher. She didn't say anything that she didn't mean and she didn't uh, promise anything without following it through, sadly, in some cases. Well, that's right. Uh, she was very, very consistent. The post- postman arrived. It's all right, it's the, it's the postman arriving. <laughs> Good guess. Um, she was very consistent. She was... She, her, her time in office, I think, split into three different bits, to be honest. The first bit was... And when I say in office, I mean as leader of the Conservative Party yeah. Yeah. and therefore uh, helping to generate and um, articulate the ideas of people like Hayek uh, and, um, and so on. Um, I mean, she established very quickly, for example, that there was hardly any Conservative-leaning economic philosophy. Mm. And with Keith Joseph's help through the uh, research department, basically they commissioned it. You know, how, how does a non-socialist state work? Mm. Uh, it seems astonishing now, but a lot of that was very original, very, very fresh thought. Lots of extremely bright uh, young people there who later became MPs and ministers. And so in the first phase, she was a little hesitant, very careful, doing a lot of homework, a lot of research, very good with numbers, scientists, mm. um, very evidence-based. In the second phase, I think from the Falklands onwards, from 82 onwards, through the miners' strike, through much of the privatisation, the big bang in the city and so on, um, she was one of the greatest leaders this country has ever seen. She was, as you say, clear in what she wanted, uh, had a clear agenda, clear programme, Huge majority in Parliament, huge support in the country. Let's get on with it, everybody. Um, uh, and a supine opposition, which was a big help. Um, again, led by a very nice man. Neil Kinnock was a lovely man. <laughs> Still is, but he was useless. Um, <laughs> wow, don't hold back. <laughs> uh, well, he typified what, what she was fighting against, which is theory and philosophy and argument and debate and depending on the state and old industries that uh, relied on subsidies from the taxpayer who was actually in more successful smaller businesses they really needed um, uh, more recognition um, mm. not more support they needed um, a higher place in the economic and political hierarchy and that's what they got with Margaret and then the fir- third phase was from about 1989 onwards when she was celebrating 10 years in office and yeah. she stopped collecting information from there onwards. Her gut feeling was what was really mattered, not oh, really okay. matter. And she was quite rude and quite arrogant and slightly bonkers. And I think by then we'd all got a bit fed up with it. And it became apparent that if we let her lead us into the next election, which was likely to be 91, 92, mm-hmm. we'd lose it. So by then, Richard, it seemed clear that if we wanted to keep Thatcherism uh, then we had to get rid of Thatcher and that's what we did. Oh wow okay Um, is there anything that you regret from your time as an MP? Oh loads of things but one of the great advantages of being older is you forget (laughs) Well as I said earlier that's the same in 30s heading into the 40s. Um, You were junior health minister do you remember a time when you uh, were affected badly with your mental health uh, throughout your whole life not just as a politician? That's a very good question. Um, I can remember being devastated, heartbroken indeed. Um, not, not so much when uh, I lost my job over eggs, because mm. I knew I was right over eggs, and it was just a question of time before uh, that became the case. And I also felt a long that, time, though. Well, mm, fairly quickly actually, because within a matter of months. Um, programmes like Derek Cooper's food programme on BBC Mm. and um, wonderful experts like Professor Hugh Pennington were saying, uh, no, we really do have a problem. I mean, it was about 10 years before it got sorted. Mm -hmm. But um, me and the egg industry have been great pals for a very long time now. um, I'm very proud of the way that they eventually got themselves sorted out with very little help from government, I may add. Um, 
But it was, it, it, at that time, I was bewildered and a bit cross. Yeah. But what I expected when uh, John Major became Prime Minister uh, during December 1990 was that I would get back into office. Yeah. Not yeah. not necessarily in health. I, mean, I think I'd had my fill of health by then. But education, I've been a teacher, housing, local government, you know, all that kind of thing. And uh, he knew perfectly well what my interests were. And the phone didn't go. And I felt devastated at that point. It's not the same as mental illness. No. You know, feeling sad, feeling low, when you have a reason to feel low, is healthy. Um, and it was a, a dark time. Soon yeah. after that, people started to rescue me. I, I had a call from various colleagues who were on the European Parliament saying, in the European Parliament, hey, come over here, come and spend a week in Brussels, we'll show you around. And they were very good to me. And they kindled this interest in, in, uh, in standing. I'd missed the 89 election, mm. but I stood in 94 in the next one. Um, and at the same time, uh, I started writing. Um, yeah. Next yeah. thing I know, I've got contracts to write novels. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, kind of the rest is history. Uh, I, I tell you, <laughs> you talk about opposition. Um, I was asked in one interview when I was writing novels, and I started to write, uh, what my ambition was. Uh, and I thought, no, I'm, not, I'm never going to be a Tolstoy or a Dickens. I'd like to write better novels than Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> Next day, I get a letter from his solicitor saying that I should withdraw that. Mm. Wow. I've wow. still got the letter. One of these days, I'll frame it and put it in the downstairs loo along with the other rubbish. Well, that sounds like an insecurity on his part. Um, I asked on Facebook and Twitter <clears throat> if anyone had any questions for you. Can you guess what name, whose name came up the most? Um... Well, I don't think it was Matt Hancock. Shall we put it like that? <laughs> no, a certain um, Mr. Major. Um, who did the chasing? Well, the first thing is he wasn't Prime Minister at the time. No. no. Um, in, in, in my fantasy, in a way, um, I and actually several of his other friends in the mid-1980s mm -hmm. encouraged him to think like that and to acquire the skills. I mean, for example, he was a very hesitant speaker. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have much of a uh, presence. He was hardly known when he entered the cabinet in 1987, immediately after the general election of 87, he was made chief secretary to the treasury. Mm. So he's, he's in the cabinet. And uh, there was a poll that showed um, that I had recognition next to Margaret Thatcher and he had 2% recognition. There's a point at which you have to say to him, listen, you know, you would make a very good prime minister. Sooner or later, Margaret's going to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it won't be Michael Hessel time. Why not? Because half the party hates him. And, and anyone that puts up against him, who has friends and who's liked, has got a very good chance of actually winning it, which is the way it turned out. Um, mm. But you've got to have a higher presence. You've got to, you've got to be on programs like um, Any Questions and Question Time. Yeah. And yeah. He, he actually contacted the Question Time um, uh, director, the, the producer, and she said, who are you? I think we'd better audition you. And he said, I'm in the cabinet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Jesus. And, yeah, I remember that. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he actually had a very good manner for TV. It went down extremely well. Mm -hmm. the, the old and more, more bombastic style was, uh, was disappearing. So, who did the chasing? Um, <laughs> two people see each other. Yeah. Two yeah. people uh, in the same environment. There were hardly any women in the House of Commons, mm -hmm. Richard. Hardly any women MPs. There were plenty of women um, uh, staff. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to have an affair, it needed to be with somebody who had as strong a reason as you had for keeping it a secret mm. and who had the same ability that you had to keep a secret yeah, um, yeah. and um yeah i remember we were talking about what had happened to cecil parkinson and he was in a situation where the person that he 
uh, had an affair with didn't want to keep the secret because he abandoned her. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. So it was kind of mutual. But I finished it because once he was in cabinet, uh, the risk was too great. Yeah. Plus he didn't have enough time. Plus, uh, plus I was writing books by then. And the one thing you need when you're writing books is um, three or four hours to yourself where mm -hmm. you're not going to have somebody saying, Edwina, are you coming to bed? Well, well, that puts him in his place. Um, you said earlier on that you ran in the 2021 um, local elections. Uh, so would it be fair to say that you missed politics? Well, that was, no, that was, I mean, the, people talk about mental health now and we're all very much more on our guard of, about depression. And I think that's such a good thing. So yeah. Yeah. My, my husband, John Jones, um, absolutely wonderful man, um, died in November year, after a long battle with cancer. Although it's, only, you know, it's only in the last, it's only in the final five or six weeks that you realise that that's, which way it's going mm -hmm. and um we were able to look after him at home and yeah. afterwards you're in a kind of a mad flurry for several weeks you've got to sort out probate you've got to sort out bills who's going to pay for things and you know you've got enough money coming in that kind of thing and then there's a hell of a big gap a huge black hole and um churchill called it black dog mm. and you it, it's a very good idea to start thinking about the practical ways to come out of it. What advice would you give to somebody else in those situations? And the answer is mm -hmm. find something to do that you really like doing and it's going to take you over. Uh, and I was asked to stand for the council and I thought, yep, yeah, that'll fit. And I enjoyed doing it. And if I got elected, I would have enjoyed being a councillor. So on the night of the election, I was a bit, ooh. That didn't work, did it? Yeah, but it's evident that you love the area that you live in, so why not, I suppose? Why not? If you're going to represent an area, it's good to live in it. Mm. It's um, an area with a high percentage of older people, very high vaccination rates here. So what that tells me is mm. a lot of sensible people. <laughs> and I did rather feel that, um, you know, during the pandemic, older people had been a bit neglected yeah yeah they were not the highest priority well uh, that's because they behave themselves and they come from a generation that don't stand up jump up and down saying me 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 <laughs> um, and i felt that if i was on the council i could make a virtue of being a bit older i would say do carry my box for me do carry my bags for me come and collect me <laughs> Um, but then when it came to discussion about uh, patterns of care, for example, I would say, look, this is how I think old people would react to it. And the fact that my, uh, my opponent, the successor, the successful candidate is only in her 40s means that I think that neglect will continue. With that in mind, though, what did you think about the uh, Dominic Cummings text message revelations, what Boris Johnson had said about the over 80s? Well, what do I think about Dominic Cummings and his revelations? I think he's a turd, and if he was around, I'd be happy to step in him. Uh, I think he's a most um, egregious example of a, a, a disloyal and disgruntled employee that I think I've ever seen. Mm. That alone taints what he says and what he does. Uh, I think ministers are entitled to assume that the arguments and the debates, especially the heated debates and the um, when you're tossing around ideas and you're tossing, tossing around the extremities of an idea, that these are not going to leak into the public domain. That's mm -hmm. why civil servants, including Cummings, signed yeah. the Official Secrets Act. You don't get good debate. You don't get good policy making if everyone's looking over their shoulder. Yeah. yeah, and so what he's done is uh, it's wicked, absolutely wicked. Now, um, what did what were they doing? They were testing out. It's not an entirely stupid idea. The way Sweden went about reacting to the pandemic was effectively to say to all its older, most vulnerable people, stay away, stay at home, lock yourselves in. And to the younger people, enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. Now, 
that's come back to bite them in several ways. First of all, because even in Sweden, people in old people's homes died in large numbers. Nobody realised how old people's homes worked and how they were using, I think probably particularly at weekends, large numbers of agency workers going from home to home. Nobody yeah. realised. And perhaps nobody realised that the the status, the the wages, the training of a lot of these staff lay, left still leaves an enormous amount to be uh, to be done, a huge amount. You're not talking about highly educated people with university degrees going to be highly respectable and responsible here sometimes. You're talking about caring individuals who don't think they're going to catch COVID, don't suffer from it, and go from home to home, and the people whose faces they wash will die. Mm. And I don't, I, that's, it, it, when that happened in Sweden and many other countries, Mm. You you realise that actually it needs a worldwide revolution to improve something like this. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, what Boris, I think, was doing was testing boundaries. If only old people die, and they're going to die anyway, why lockdown? And this is the view of, of Jonathan Sumption, you know, the uh, retired... Uh, uh, high court judge mm. but actually this turns out to be wrong because the average 80 year old has at least five years to live yeah yeah and so the idea that they're disposable is simply wrong it's it's not based on accurate data um and also very large numbers of them are not incapable and said oh you know we're voters uh we will be we will take decisions uh, in our own interests, we will stay at home. They still are, Richard. You know, I went to the theatre yeah. the other night, average audience much younger than me. Mm. On the train, hardly any old people. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They're still being extremely cautious. Yeah, I've got a friend in his late 70s who is still kind of really reticent to go out um, and about, which I find really sad. Um, but what can I say to him? Um, um, what you can say is, if he's been vaccinated and you go somewhere that's safe and clean, he's probably fine. Well, actually, that being said, he did go to the theatre the other night to watch Hairspray, which he absolutely loved, and it made me very, very jealous because I'm missing theatre so much. This is not... Um, I, I, I sometimes take issue with people who talk a lot about uh, mental illness. I think sometimes they are giving a, a specific term to a much wider range of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is cautious about going out uh, is, is, is being cautious. Yeah. yeah, That's not a mental illness, that's mm -hmm. wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll respond to uh, sensible and well evidence-based information. Someone who doesn't respond to sensible, caring, evidence-based information may well be suffering from a phobia or from depression that needs a different uh, way of going about them. Uh, and and I, I think it, how shall I put it, it makes it harder for people mm. with very serious mental illnesses who really are going to kill themselves yeah. if we just assume that lots and lots of us have it. Well, I think you said it earlier on, you know, if you're worried about something that maybe you should be worried about, then is there really a problem there? Yeah. But you may still need the same kind of techniques of empathy to come mm. out. Yeah, yeah, empathy and understanding, something that seems to be devoid a lot, i found, in the country lately. Oh, no, I don't agree. Do you I not? No, no, no. Well, maybe you should come sorry, to sorry. where we live. Yeah, maybe I should clarify, probably in the social media world. Well, then get off the social media yeah. world. Yeah. The social yeah, media possibly. world, particularly... Um, uh, not, the, the way I do it is that I'm public on Twitter and I'm private on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but what tends to happen is because people are at home and hiding behind um, anonymous uh, monikers, yeah. they yeah. feel that they can do and say whatever they want. And that's mm. why I sometimes, uh, as you have noticed, I call them out. And sometimes mm -hmm. you think, you blithering idiot. I've got one guy who I called out on Twitter. Um, he was being very rude indeed about my 
attitude to Scottish independence. So I, I, I challenged him, where do you live? Where exactly do you live? He lives in Madrid, <laughs> right? And what exactly do you do for a living? Um, well, he's an anarchist, all right? Um, is this his job? He has a job teaching other people about how, teaching the Spanish how to be anarchists. Oh. To so which my response is, you colonialist, you? Yeah. What, now I've really got him annoyed. Yeah. yeah. What, a job? what a job. Who'd have thought Who'd that, have thought existed? that existed? Ah, um, <laughs> he keeps quoting Proudhon at me. Quoting it in French, Spanish or English. Proudhon was the French anarchy writer, mm. you know, and um, dead against any kind of government. Pardon me, you managed to get from Scotland to Spain. You must have gone through some kind of regulatory process to do that that's keeping yeah. you yeah. safe. Oh, and you think, you're just an idiot. Yeah. I couldn't possibly comment on him, but the social media world does seem to have quite a lot of idiots. No, I just want to add something else. Oh, go on. Because, oh, go on. because some of the stuff, for example, on racism, do you remember when the, uh, uh, with Black Lives Matter, yeah. um, the, uh, the three penalty shootout guys and so on? Mm -hmm. Some of that, quite clearly, is coming from bots. And it's, um, it's soft warfare that's being waged by um, our enemies, people that wish us ill. Uh, yeah. there, there are some very, very good organisations that trace where nasty stuff is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I think, it, uh, to me, it's pretty clear that there is a conspiracy, but it's a different conspiracy. The conspiracy is uh, coming from Putin, it's coming from Russia, um, mm -hmm. and it's trying to unsettle the Western world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And basically, we should be much more resilient. Well, as I said earlier, you seem like quite a resilient person, so I suppose it's, it's, uh, it works well for you. Don't go on social media if you're feeling down. Do oh, not definitely. go on oh, social definitely. media after, after you've had a drink, ever. Social yeah. media when you've got something to say and you're feeling good about where you are. Give yourself an hour and then do something else. Yeah, I talk to people a lot about comparisons on social media. And, you know, no one's going to go on social media and post their worst picture or the worst thing about their life at the time. And yet we compare all the time. It's so damaging. They do some, yeah. But comparing yourself with others is a factor of um, it's a pattern of maturity. It happens a lot in adolescence. It happens a lot with kids because you're creating pecking orders. It's a it's a deep seated instinct. But what happens when you get a bit older is you think sod that for a lark. I really don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm nearly at that stage now. Nearly. Um, <laughs> so which do you prefer then, writing or politics? I tend to enjoy whatever I'm doing at the time I'm doing it. Oh, that's brilliant self-awareness, mindfulness. Well, if I get into the zone and it's working and I'm happy with it and it's going well, uh, that's good. I loved being an MP. It was a, an ambition. I loved being a minister. I got a lot done. I brought in all sorts of things. You know, one, one of my heroes is Disraeli mm -hmm. and Home Secretary, whose name was R.A. Cross, who brought in all sorts of... Um, changes in the 90, in the 1870s in a period of about four years got a hell of a lot done that helped to create the modern world um, artisan dwelling act and all sorts of town and country planning factory acts and so on making previous legislation effective so um, I love being a minister I love getting things done for um, improving women's health like breast cancer screening cervical cancer screening Improving children's health, helping with the bringing in the MMR vaccine, and of course the the, the rubella part of that, mm -hmm. um, uh, help with women's health as well. Because you catch it when you're pregnant, you may have a, a, a very severely disabled child. Yeah. Um, and um, I was on the HIV team, the campaigning team <laughs> that did the "Don't Die of Ignorance." We saved thousands of lives. I don't care how rude people are about it. We really did make a difference. Hmm. And um, I've done a few other things as well, like gay rights and so on. Um, yeah. yeah. But you Thank get you. to Thank the stage you. where, you know, when you get to the stage where you think, do you know what? You need to refresh who you are and what you're doing. And yeah. when yeah. that ended for me in uh, 1997, yeah, by then I was quite glad to move on and to go and do other things. And then the novels took over for a bit. Um, do you have any coming up? Yeah. Um, yeah, what, what happens is not so much that the novels take over. Writing the novels is a solitary activity. 
Mm. Um, going to festivals and talking about the novels and selling the novels is a very gregarious activity and takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You can well understand why Louis de Bernier found himself with seven barren years between Captain Corelli's Mandolin and Birds Without Wings, which was equally wonderful, because you're too damn busy. Yeah. And you have to be quite disciplined to say, no, nope, no, nope, now I'm writing again. Um, right now, I'm in the throes of planning in some detail, not a novel, but a book about my family. Oh, what? Um, during, during lockdown and during the years that when I was married to John, when I couldn't really do any concentrated work, I did a lot of research on my family and on his and there are it's quite a story you know my grandfather arrived in britain aged 16 yeah. Yeah. in 1897 into a thriving liverpool we have no idea how he got there um he said um and i can remember his him telling the story there were three brothers and we had enough money for one to go to america and one to go to australia and we drew lots, and I lost. That's why you were born in Liverpool. <laughs> it's a story of immigrants everywhere. It's, it's not, in our family, it's not a story of um, being brought up in a fatherless home, like, say, Mark, Marcus Rashford yeah. or uh, Jay Blades. If you haven't mm. read Jay Blades' autobiography, you should. It is astonishing. Oh. how actually many millions of immigrant families come just wanting to bring up the family, put the food on the table, pay the bills, have the respect of their neighbours, not that bothered about getting wealthy, would like the children to do better. So they are the stepping stones by which their children, they hope, will go on to a better life than the one that they knew as children. And that's what my grandfather did. And it was, it's, an, it's an astonishing story. Um, he was in the First World War. There's a picture of him on the wall. We all thought he was a hero. He never sure saw a shot fired, fired in anger. I got his war records. Uh, but the, the place he came from went up in smoke. It was in Poland. It was one of the places where it's been shown it wasn't the Nazis, it wasn't the Germans that did it, it was the local people. Um, he was a soldier in the First War. He came in 1897. Hmm. But in the Second World War, if he hadn't been in Britain, he would have gone up and smoke in the synagogue along with the 90-year-old rabbi who bomb it's for him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's all on record. Once you start, once you start digging like this, Richard, yeah. you don't know where it's going to take you, and sometimes it's very painful. I was going to say it must be an emotional experience to read those things. What I have to do is put it together in a way that is of interest to the general public, hmm. uh, and so I've got to be a translator, if you like, yeah. and yeah. helps to convey. What an astonishing achievement it is, in these circumstances, to be ordinary. Mm. Yeah. Well, it sounds amazing anyway. He sounds amazing. Well, oh, he was lovely. He was lovely. Um, we, in, in Jewish families, um, one of the prescribed events is to have a service at home, round the dinner table, with glasses mm. of wine, and it's called Passover. Mm. And the Everyone's got to be there. The head of the table was my grandfather, and I was the youngest sentient child. I was six years old, and it's my job this year to ask the questions, the four questions, which are set out in the service, that the child's got to be there to ask a question. And the first question is, why is this night not like all other nights? On all other nights, we do this, we do that, we eat bitter herbs tonight, we eat matzah tonight, What's going on, Grandad? <laughs> and everyone goes, well done, well done. And then my grandfather looks at me. I think I'm six. And he says, it is because our ancestors were slaves in the land of Egypt. And the Lord God, in his wisdom and 
mighty strength brought us out and Pharaoh's armies were drowned in the Red Sea. And then he starts to read the service in, in Hebrew. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it must have happened when he was an, a, a small child about the same age as me. That's how immediate it all was. Mm. Wow. Yeah. The, ch I, I, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. We built the pyramids. Listen, we've got something. To, we built the Colosseum in Rome. We were slaves in Rome. We've got something to be proud of. Oh, well, you've got many things to be proud of. Um, speaking of which, why did you go into the jungle and how was that experience? <laughs> um, so it's, where are we? It's uh, 2014, I think. Mm. Now, the jungle participants are normally settled in about... June, July, and they fly out there towards the end of October. Mm. And so I'm assuming I'm not going, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I love the program. I love I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. I'm assuming I'm not going. Uh, I'm thinking of other things to do. And um, then we get a phone call from my agent. And uh, Wendy says, Edwin, have you got an up-to-date passport? Yes. Have you got or have you ever had a visa to work in Australia? I have, as it happens, because if you lecture on cruise ships and you dock in Australia, you have to have an Australian visa. I have, mm. yes. Oh, right, she said. Can you go for the, uh, the medical in Manchester tomorrow? Why? Because you're flying to Brisbane on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and I immediately said, business class, both ways. Oh, I'm not going. <laughs> and of course, what's happened is somebody has dropped out or been dropped out. We had no idea. Maybe they failed the medical. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had a conviction for cannabis many years ago. The Australians won't give them a visa. Yeah. Maybe they didn't have an up-to-date passport. You'd be surprised how many people think, oh, yes, I'm going. Oh, my God, I've only got, you know, it was out of date three weeks ago. Can I get a new passport? No, you can't. Not in that period of time. <laughs> That's it, mate. And it was a tremendous experience, I must say. Oh, God, I bet. If I was in that celebrity world, um, it's something that I would love to do, absolutely love to do. And, of course, now it's just up the road in Abergelly, the castle. I thought it was brilliant last year, and I have to say, I hope they do it again. I read this morning that they are back at the castle this year. Oh, excellent. You know why? First of all, it's a proper... It, it, it's, it's not a... It's a proper castle. It's the mm. real thing. It's been there a thousand years. I used, to, I used to break into it all the time. <laughs> and it's wonderful that actually this will mean it can be not restored, but it can be made safe and it can be um, yeah. Yeah. a big tourist attraction mm. uh, for the local area. They're doing so much work on it. It's, it. They're brilliant. And secondly, it made the programme makers and the games makers think very, very hard indeed about how to do it. And they came up with some wonderful, you know, seriously exciting things to do that were great to film and made the programme very, very refreshing. Excellent. Mm. And even in times of COVID, it brought in a lot of tourism into the area. Maybe it shouldn't have done, but hey, ho, it did. Well, it did. I, I, you know, you can, you can be a, a safe COVID tourist. I mean, there's mm. stuff, stuff in the papers today, the research today, showing that our uh, railway stations are an awful lot safer than we thought they were. Not a trace of COVID. How about that? That's good. That's Absolutely. Good. That's good. So who is Edwina Curry in 2021? What brings you enjoyment these days? Uh, the simple things of life bring me enjoyment. This is what happens when you've come through COVID, when you've lost a much loved partner of 20 years and seen what cancer does, let alone what COVID does. Yeah. Um, and when you realise, uh, yeah, OK, I, uh, the first 25 years of my life, you know, student, ambitious and all the rest of it, got married. The next 50 years, <coughs> um, years of um, achievement and, and uh, managing to actually fulfil every ambition. Now I'm nearly 75, I'll be 75 later this year. Um, inshallah, I might have another 20 years, 25 years. God, who knows? Only God knows. And... Um, you value things like good health. You value things like being able to get out of your chair without assistance and being able to walk with the dogs. You value having dogs. We're now fast asleep. Look, I'm looking at them and they're well out of it. 
You value <sighs> having good friends, good food, being solvent, just having enough money for everyday things. You value having a garden, <laughs> roses and sweet peas in a little pot right in front of me that I can smell from here. You value, having, you value having your brain. I've seen so many people going downhill with dementia, Richard. You yeah. value your brain and you do what you can to keep it all healthy. And you value being able to do a little bit to help other people still, if you can. Well, as a fellow doggy parent, I completely get the importance of them on my mental health. The amount of walking that I've done in the last 18 months, they're probably sick of it. They're probably sick of me. Well, that's also, bear in mind, that's also good for physical health. Um, the person who is physically well um, probably has the leading edge over uh, someone who isn't in their mental health as well. Uh, there's, you know, if 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 the if the body thinks it's needed and in good shape, and the brain will respond to that much better. So, you know, a lot of people during COVID and during lockdown have done. To their own surprise, they've done quite well. A lot of quieter people mm. have done well. We don't all have to be you know, screaming extroverts. Sometimes being quiet is also a sign of good health. Yeah, I turned my life around during the last 18 months. Um, I felt quite guilty about that, actually, with everyone suffering hardship and stuff like that. I, th I felt guilty that I'd actually done well the last 18 months. I don't think so anymore. I'm quite proud of myself now. Um, Edwina Query, thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're a really busy person. So um, thank you. It's amazing. An absolutely amazing conversation. Richard, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I will talk to you soon, hopefully. It's been an absolute pleasure. So there you go, people. I hope you found benefit in listening today. And if you like listening... Pick up the phone to somebody that you know would like to talk. You know that somebody that would benefit from having a chat. Um, if you do need to talk, then please feel free. Pick up the phone. Speak to people. Contact me on Twitter at Richard Sefton3. Um, get involved. If you really need to speak to somebody, 116123 is the number for the Samaritans. And they are waiting to take your call. And that's another episode of State of Mind with me, Richard Sefton. I hope you can join me for the next one. Thank you. Take care. Mwah.